what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. It's been a little while, huh? Well, it's that time of the year. Creepshow the series is back on the channel, and the creep has returned with more horrifying tales. Let's not waste any time and just jump right into it. Last time, we covered four stories. Night of the Paw, where a man attempts to bring his wife back to life using the power of a monkey paw, with disastrous results. Times is tough and musky holler, an apocalyptic future where retribution is paid in flesh. Four zombies. Skin Crawlers, the tale of people trying to lose weight by taking a killer shortcut. By the silver water of Lake Champlain, where a man's quest to solve the mystery of an ancient creature is taken upon by his children. And the holiday special, Shapeshifters Anonymous, telling the true origins of Santa Claus and his war with shapeshifting kind. Scott, what are you doing? Are you crazy? Your reign of evil ends today, Kringle. <laughs> Holy shit! This time we'll be exploring some tales involving classic monsters and revisit situations at the very root of Creepshow with a fresh coat of paint and crossovers. Season 2, Episode 1, Model Kid. If you're a fan of the Universal Monsters or the classic Creepshow movie, you're going to love this episode. Even from the very beginning, we open up with Gilman meets the mummy. No, this movie isn't an actual thing that existed, but it does serve as a fantastic homage to the old monster crossovers like Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. This time inspired by the silent film era and the legends of the mummy and creature from the Black Lagoon. As expected from Creepshow, no CG present here, just people in high quality monster suits and they look phenomenal. But this isn't a movie we're watching, it's all in the imagination of a young boy in 1972, Joe or as his family calls him, Jojo. I would have been best friends with this kid growing up. He's obsessed with horror and monster movies, and he's a little weird, which is awesome because being normal is boring. Sadly, kids like this are often looked down upon by other kids in society. Anyone growing up in the early 90s, for example, can relate to this. You always have those certain things that kids think isn't cool, and if certain kids like it, they get made fun of. In the 90s, if you liked video games, Pokemon, anime, you were a nerd and you got made fun of. Now it's cool to like such things. Always be yourself. In this era of the early 70s, oftentimes movies and comic books were blamed for society's problems with the youth. Joe has a tough life trying to be himself, to say the least. He gets bullied at school, covers his black eye with makeup so his mom can't see it, and he imagines the worst things happening to his bully. Yo, Dr. Frankenstein, say hi to your mom for me. Ugh. This episode has a little bit of everything, both horror and heart. It's actually genuinely sad. On top of being bullied and made fun of, his mother is also dying of cancer, and his aunt Barb, who loves him very much, and his asshole Uncle Kevin, are staying with them for some time to help out. Uncle Kevin is a dick. He is insufferable. He's that stereotypical alpha male that loves football. He drinks beer. He thinks all kids should have nudie magazines under their beds. He hates all this horror stuff. He has absolutely no respect for it. More tang? No thanks. I never drink. Tang. <laughs> Why not? Joe likes tang. He's just, he's doing his, his Dracula. Mm -hmm. Bad look, I see, right? Played him in the first one. Technically, Max Shrek played him in the first one. The silent version, Nosferatu, 1922. Bela Lugosi was a dope addict. Look it up in the encyclopedia. I'm not crazy about the new guy. What's his name? Uh, Christopher Lee. No, that's the karate guy. <laughs> yeah, look it up. Clearly, Joe was upset about them moving in because of Uncle Kevin, but he still had his mom by his side. They spend time together watching classic monster movies like Abbott and Costello, and it does give you the feels when his mom speaks about how important movies are, almost like memories frozen in time that you can revisit time and time again. Movies, they transport us. Think about it. I bet you remember exactly where you were and who you were with the very first time you heard Dr. Frankenstein yell. It's a love. <laughs> I was with you. That's right. And then she dies right next to him. That is heart-wrenching. 
After this, the episode goes full creep show, as it was always destined to. Three months later, Joe is being raised by Aunt Barb and Uncle Kevin. And Uncle Kevin, he's worse than ever. He can't hold a job, so he's home all the time. He's an absolute loser. He has had it with Joe's horror stuff. What do you think you're doing? Cleaning house. There's going to be no more Santa Claus, no more Tooth Fairy, and no more goddamn monsters. You're the only monster around here. Stay away from him. Or what? Huh? Joe is completely distraught. He hates Uncle Kevin. He wants him gone and he misses his mom horribly. And then the supernatural seems to occur. His projector turns on by itself mysteriously and his mother rises from her grave to let him know that she's still watching over him mom? through his movies and through his monster friends. And she hands him a creep show comic book. But wait, it was all a dream. Or was it? This comic is special. Inside, it contains an advertisement for a model kit known as The Victim. Joe orders it, and on one special day, a friendly mailman brings him a package. The victim has arrived. At this moment, what this episode actually is finally hit me. It's a remake slash updated version of the original anthology's intro and outro story. The one starring Stephen King's son with the abusive father that hates all the monster stuff, and the boy gets a voodoo doll to destroy him and take revenge. That's this episode, but a slightly altered version. It's so cool that they remade it. It made the episode 10 times more exciting for me now that they had a massive callback to the original. A genuine treat for Creepshow fans. Just like the original kid, Joe goes to town on Uncle Kevin with no mercy. He breaks his foot to test everything out. He puts his foot back into place. Uncle Kevin has no idea what the hell is going on. He starts getting a fever that inexplicably keeps shooting up. Turns out Joe had the victim figure on top of a heater. And ultimately, Uncle Kevin, he just can't take it anymore. He hears noises coming from Joe's room, and he's gonna beat his ass. But instead of finding a young, scared boy, he finds that Joe's imagination is far more powerful than ever expected. Uncle Kevin has been destroyed by the Gill Man and the Mummy, only to be discovered by his horrified wife. And Joe has gone full-blown into monster mode, now fully emulating Count Dracula. The lesson here? Don't mess with weird kid. The power of imagination is a mighty thing. What happened? A couple of friends came for a visit. They had some cleaning up to do. After all... It is chore day. The next episode, Public Television of the Dead. This is quite possibly my favorite creep show episode of all time now, or at least way up there on the list. Instead of a sad opening like Joe's life falling apart around him with an abusive uncle coming in, and his mother dying of a horrible sickness, Public Television of the Dead opens up with a much more lighthearted tone. With a public broadcasting station called WQPS out of Pittsburgh, it's basically a spoof of those PBS stations from our childhoods, where shows like Mr. Rogers, A Lamb Chop, and Painting with Bob Ross would brighten up our days. Except we see the drama behind the scenes and meet another insufferable character in the form of Mrs. Bookberry. The WQPS Fletch Drive. That's where we ask all the mommies and daddies out there to fuck. Oh. <coughs> God 
Damn it, line. Become a member of Channel 13's television family. Okay, whatever, here we go. Cut, I think we got it. Greg, I'm gonna go take a shit. I'll be in my dressing room. Now, if you don't mind, I prefer to wipe my ass in private, unless you wanna come in and do it for me. You got me, sister? Ms. Bookberry thinks she's hot shit. She demands a better time slot for her show, which means another show has to suffer to accommodate her. And that show would be The Love of Painting with Norm Roberts, an obvious spoof of the beloved Bob Ross painting show of the similar style, where Bob Ross would paint with a calm demeanor for the kids at home. Evil Ms. Bookberry's demands are forcing the studio to close down the show, but he takes it like a champ. He's very friendly on and off screen, so much that he has no negative feeling towards anybody else, a true saint. But he does have some internalized PTSD from Vietnam. God bless. Are you cutting our budget again, Claudia? You can't do that. I'm not cutting the budget. I'm afraid we're canceling Love of Painting. Oh no. It's too bad. May we still shoot this next one? How is he always so calm? You think he'd at least chew me out for screwing him over? That man's changed a lot since he came back from Nam. Norm was on the front line of the Tet Offensive. Must have had to do horrible things to survive. Now the cause of this episode's creep show, another one of the network shows has a special guest. Good evening and welcome. Today's first guest, Mr. Ted Raimi, has brought us something quite special. Ted Raimi, brother of Sam Raimi, playing himself. Ted Raimi's on this show with a special artifact, a mysterious book that may be familiar to some of you. Brilliant Samarian craftsmanship. The stitching and the binding is magnificent. It's bound in a leather that I'm unfamiliar with. It is locked, though. Do you have the key? Um... I lost it. Oh, how unfortunate. But then it was found. Excellent. Yeah. Let's look inside. I mean, uh, you know, I've, I've had this thing in my fruit cellar for years. I nearly threw it out like a million times. But I'm glad I didn't, though, huh? That's right, my friends, it's the book from Evil Dead, the Necronomicon, and all its glory. Not a knockoff, not a spoof. This is a full-blown Evil Dead crossover, and it rocks. And oh yeah, he reads from the book, and all hell unleashes, as expected. Nosferatum. Lalumortum. Ah, uh, stop. Don't, don't read anymore. Ilsebitu. Inertazababa Nergal. Please. Nergal! Stop! Nergal! I said stop. Much like Evil Dead, this episode's filled with both horror and comedic elements, cheesy lines and exaggerated zoom-ins, as it should. But there's no Ash here. There's no chainsaw-wielding hero. Instead, we get fake Bob Ross, Norm Roberts, ready for action with a positive attitude. He's fantastic, truly the hero we need in these dark times. Unfortunately, this is our last episode. First, I was sad, but I believe that everything happens for a reason. And if this is what the good Lord wishes, well, then surely he must have something greater in mind for me and for us all. Let your soul in the book. What is that thing? I don't know who you are, sir. But if you're not going to behave, then I have to ask you to leave. But Ted Raimi isn't done. We know deadites aren't stopped so easily. 
Once you read from the book, the darkness spreads uncontrollably. Even Miss Bookberry falls victim to its influence. You worthless piece of shit. I'm not worthless, Daddy. Yes, you are. Are you deaf? I said go away. Take your soul to the park! The entire station is an absolute wreck. Monster Ted Raimi ripped through everybody. Bodies are everywhere. The only survivors here are Norm, George, and Claudia. It's a great cast of characters working together to survive this outrageous monster attack, and you'd think it's a genuine episode of Ash vs. Evil Dead. It would fit perfectly in, and Norm figures that the only way to stop the Deadites is to lock the book. He's got it all figured out. Of course, we have all the fun creep show elements too, with the crazy colorful backgrounds like a live comic book, a staple of the creep show series that should never ever change. But there's a bigger problem than just locking the book. Monster Miss Bookberry is on live TV reading the Necronomicon, risking the entire world, and only our heroic trio can save the day. I'm responsible for the program quality of Channel 13, and this show does not meet WQPS standards. And what are you going to do about it? This is the greatest line in this entire episode. You can see the anticipation in the actor's face, just waiting excitedly to get his moment to say it. Groovy. Absolute fan service. In the epic final battle, it's all up to Norm to save the world and lock the book. Luckily, he's equipped with the key and some more camera zoom-ins. <laughs> Ms. Bookberry is cancelled, decapitated on live TV, which Claudia and George think is hilarious. And Norm gets the last laugh after all. His show is no longer cancelled, it's actually going national now. A truly happy ending, but not quite. See, some of the incantations made it to the kids via live TV. The Deadites will return. There is no lesson at all in this episode. It's a straight up Evil Dead creep show monster mash crossover. It's fun, it's dumb, and it's up there with creep show royalty. Season 2, Episode 2 Dead and Breakfast. It begins with the spooky tale of Old Lady Spinster, one of the most prolific serial killers of all time and the first female serial killer in the United States. Except for the fact that nobody knows about her except her grandchildren, Pam, and her brother Sam. They run a bed and breakfast that they claim is haunted and attempt to run it as a tourist attraction. Pam idolizes her grandmother and wants to share her supposed terrible crimes with the rest of the world. The cries of her victims! Oh, beware! 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 But you still have two nights left on your reservation! I told you we should have gone to Dollywood! Who would want to stay here? These people are frauds. But they're horrible failures. They're bleeding money, and most other serial killer attractions get way more traffic than they ever did. And it's actually kind of funny that Jeffrey Dahmer's apartment is shown there as an attraction, because whoever is running that is completely running a scam. That entire complex was torn down in real life. Pam and Sam's last remaining hope Social media influencers! They reach out to a popular one known for visiting these dark attractions called Morgan, otherwise known as Morg. I'm at the Spinster Murder House, and if you've never heard of it, don't be ashamed. This one is a deep cut, even for the Morg. The story goes that 80 years ago, Old Lady Spinster, the proprietor of this hotel, murdered an untold number of guests. After confessing to her crimes, she died in an insane asylum. Uh, no. Hi. Actually, she did not die in an insane asylum. She died peacefully in a retirement home. 
Morg shows up, starts live streaming and checking out the property and hearing the dastardly tale of old lady spinster. She was very strict with her rules and chose her victims accordingly. Rule number one, if you smoked on the property, you die. Rule number two, if you put your feet on the furniture, disgusting, you die. Rule number three, no noise after dark, so if you decide to get playful and wrestle in bed, you die. You break any rules and old lady spinster has no mercy, you die. Except Morg immediately starts questioning the entire story. They never found them. Then how do you know it's true? Because she confessed. If there's no body, then there's no murder. That's like true crime 101. Perhaps she fed them to her victims. And the bones? They were tossed down this corpse chute to a secret basement below. That's just a dumb waiter. Or a dead waiter. The situation with the influencer goes completely ass backwards. Those damn content creators and their bad reviews. Morg never heard of these killings. She thinks it's all BS and she lets her audience know it. Pam is furious that her grandmother's legacy isn't being celebrated. This negative critic has to be stopped by any means necessary. So in an act of horrible retribution, she decides to unplug the Wi-Fi as their reservations start plunging. I find this episode so comedic. It's basically a battle between wits, between a content creator telling them that they're full of shit and Pam becoming obsessed with proving that her grandmother was a killer, as if it's some kind of family legend to be proud of. And Morg brought the tools to disprove it all, explaining away noises with rusty pipes, finding chemical trails that lead to secret liquor bottles, and grandmother's secret corpse locker where she kept all the bodies, a simple sewing room. It seems that old lady spinster was just a regular old lady. But Pam can't accept that. No way. This content creator will believe that grandmother was the greatest killer of all time, even if she has to force her to believe it. made with ghost peppers, you know, to keep away the ghosts. What the hell is wrong with you? Oh, Pamela, is that you? <gasps> you want a murder house? I'll give you a murder house. <laughs> Are you out of your fucking mind? <laughs> you can't hide from me. This is my house. Pam has completely lost her mind at this point. Pam wanted a murder house, and she created a murder house. Finally, she can advertise it as such, and they'll finally have their bed and breakfast. But her brother Sam devised a better idea. How about a murder-suicide house, all in one? An excellent combo. Sam. I'm right here, sis. After all, maybe grandmother didn't kill anybody. So we can still make this a murder house. <laughs> Well, sis, I hate to admit it, but you were right. There's definitely a market for horror. <laughs> no, no, no! Please don't kill me, Miss Pizza! <laughs> and now to join my dear grandmother in hell. There are no good guys here. Sam kills Pam and takes advantage of his sister's murder. The bed and breakfast is better than ever. The business is a great success, but you know there has to be a twist. The bad guy can't get away with such a betrayal. Uh-oh, grandmother actually was a serial killer and hit her crime so well that nobody ever knew. Now Sam is trapped forever in her actual secret corpse room. The irony. Very enjoyable episode, a commentary about how we as a society tend to sensationalize horrible things, and also highlighting how some people simply can't take criticism. 
Careful with social media influencers if you aren't ready for bad reviews. The last episode of this evening, Pesticide. Honestly, this isn't one of my favorite episodes, and it just so happens to be very bug-centric. Maybe I just don't care for the bug episodes. The one in the original Creep Show was also my least favorite. I don't find them scary, just more gross than anything. Although this episode does have its moments. Our main character this time, Eugene from The Walking Dead, wearing a terrible wig. He plays Harlan King, running his own business of King Pest Control, where he makes its own deadly bug poisons. He's a master pest exterminator, and he loves his job. He's the king of destroying bugs, the doom slayer of insect kind. Harlan King does his job well, but he's also kind of a scumbag. He likes to leave live roaches once he's done, so they multiply, and it ensures return business as needed. That way, he always has a flow of customers. Roaches check in, but they don't check out. All right, you guys know the drill. Be fruitful and multiply. The king has spoken. During one fateful job, his life will change forever. He meets the mysterious Mr. Murdoch, Keith David. Always a pleasure to see him in anything. There's something very unusual about Mr. Murdoch, however. He seems to know way too much about Harlan King's family. He's very eager to hire him for a pest control job. He kisses his ass nonstop and offers him the opportunity of a lifetime for a briefcase filled with money if Harlan takes the job. However, the job doesn't involve your typical pest. It involves vermin of a very specific kind. I didn't say anything about rats, Mr. King. You, you did mention something about human waste? Mr. Murdoch wants Harlan to take out humans, specifically the homeless he sees infesting the area. With them gone, he can renovate the area and profit off of brand new condos. At first, Mr. King is horrified. He won't trade money for a human life, but it is a lot of money and temptation gets the better of him. He agrees to only kill one person, and that evening he sets out on a dark mission of murder. At the last minute, he has a change of heart and realizes that it's simply not worth it. But it's too late. The deal has been made, and he has to confront the people that he sought to destroy. Unknown to Harland, instead of just killing one of the homeless people, his poisons got into the food, and they all died. Which he verifies after returning to the scene of the crime. Harland's got his money, and the rest of the episode is him dealing with an enormous amount of guilt. He feels so guilty, in fact, that he starts losing his mind completely. He can't sleep anymore, he starts hallucinating all kinds of stuff, Mr. Murdoch appears spraying him with poison, he's living a nightmare. Now you really are the king. <laughs> Creepshow goodness once again, no CG in sight, just a giant prop rat monster. Although I did say this isn't one of my favorite episodes, credit where credit is due to the practical effects here. The giant bugs they use are horrific, and combined with the camera work makes the scares really effective. Even if it's not necessarily scary, the gross out aspect of a giant insect attacking you is in full swing. But is this all in his head? Does Harlan feel so incredibly guilty that he killed innocent homeless people that he's simply imagining the most horrific things? Maybe? 
he does end up at the psychiatrist office, the one that he unleashed his own roaches in to get repeat business, and he's begging for her help. He's desperate to talk to someone that can help him solve his problems. And the supernatural reveals itself. No. No, no, no. 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 Hey. This looks kind of goofy, but it's kind of funny at the same time. He's actually shrunken down to bug size and he's treated just like the bugs he destroyed. Just like the homeless people that he swatted out of their lives. You see, this is really happening. Mr. Murdoch wasn't a simple businessman. It's hinted that Mr. Murdoch was the devil himself. And Mr. King gave in to the greed of money. Bug problem. <laughs> Let's rewind that real quick. I just want to highlight how amazing Keith David's evil laugh is. One of the most majestically evil laughs of all time. <laughs> It's so good. Not one of the greatest episodes, but the performances are what really sells it. A lesson on money potentially being the root of all evil, greed forcing people to do horrible things, and at the same time a commentary on how the homeless are often viewed in society by the more fortunate. And that's Creepshow the Series, Part 4. Stay tuned for more.